Our service of Holy Eucharist, Rite 1, begins on page 323 of the Book of Common Prayer. Page 323. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And blessed be his kingdom, now and forever. Amen. Almighty God, unto whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of thy Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love thee and worthily magnify thy holy name, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear what our Lord Jesus Christ saith. Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. This is the first and great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. Have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Christ have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy upon us, Lord have mercy upon us. Lord, have mercy upon us. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Merciful God, who sent your messengers, the prophets, to preach repentance and prepare the way for our salvation, give us grace to heed their warnings and forsake our sins that we may greet with joy the coming of Jesus Christ, our Redeemer, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Please be seated for the readings. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasing to the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In lieu of a psalm today, we will recite Canticle 16 responsively by half verse. Blessed be the Lord, the God of Israel. He has come to his people and set them free. He has raised up for us a mighty Savior. Born of the house of his servant David. Through his holy prophets he promised of old that he would save us from our enemies. From the hands of all who hate us. He promised to show mercy to our fathers. And to remember his holy covenant. This was the oath he swore to our father Abraham to set us free from the hands of our enemies, free to worship him without fear, holy and righteous in his sight all the days of our life. You, my child, shall be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation, by the forgiveness of their sins, and the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. 
to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, and to guide our feet into the way of peace. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. A reading from the letter of Paul to the Philippians. I thank my God every time I remember you, constantly praying with joy in every one of my prayers for all of you, because of your sharing in the gospel from the first day until now. I am confident of this, that the one who began a good work among you will bring it to completion by the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to think this way about all of you because you hold me in your heart. For all of you share in God's grace with me, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. For God is my witness, how I long for all of you with the compassion of, Jesus, of Christ Jesus. And this is my prayer that your love may overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight to help you to determine what is best, so that in the day of Christ you may be pure and blameless, having produced the harvest of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ for the glory and praise of God. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Glory to you, Lord Christ. In the fifteenth year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was ruler of Galilee, and his brother Philip, ruler of the region of Iturea and Trachonitis, and Lysanias, ruler of Abilene, during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas, the word of God came to John, son of Zechariah, in the wilderness. He went into the region around the Jordan, proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of the prophet Isaiah. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, Prepare the way of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every valley shall be filled, and every mountain and hill shall be made low and the crooked shall be made straight, and the rough ways made smooth, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, Lord. Please be seated. Different priests have a habit of uh, introducing themselves or, or uh, of greeting the people when they enter the pulpit in different ways. A lot of times it's uh, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Um, this morning I would like to try something that maybe most of you haven't heard before. It's an Orthodox greeting. And uh, the priest comes out and says, Christ is in our midst. And the people say, he is and ever shall be. Christ is in our midst. He is and ever 
shall be. Amen. Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you this morning. I'm Greg Wildy, in case you didn't read your uh, bulletin. <laughs> but I'm sure you've heard that uh, we were coming, so uh, it's a pleasure to be here and an honor. Advent is a season in which we are given opportunity to engage in a little more self-assessment than we normally do, to admit that we might be off balance, that we need a break to regroup and deal with the mixed messages that we seem to be getting from all different directions over the last few weeks, or longer. We hear news, 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 but we're still waiting for good news. At this time of year, our culture encourages us to walk or drive around in a kind of pre-Christmas zombie haze. <laughs> Companies are just now uh, turning a profit, and they want us to feel like it is Christmas, not Advent. We're told it is a season for generosity, which is a thinly veiled call to buy more stuff. <laughs> but even though a lot of the hype surrounding this time of year is rooted in materialism and everyone's trying to make a buck while people are in a good mood, it's still hard to be too cynical. It's hard not to feel a little excitement amidst the smells, the decorations, all the good food, the prospect of how our kids and grandkids and spouses and friends might react to the gifts that we have for them, or even over the prospect of what we might receive ourselves. The possibility of snow hangs in the air. Some of us like that. <laughs> Christmas trees and greens go up, and the time we spend decorating them connects us with memories of winters and Christmases past, for better or for worse. For a little while, all the excitement can make us feel optimistic. Goodwill and generosity are contagious, after all. But there can be another view of this season that also grows out of the sparkling picture painted for us by storefronts and TV commercials, internet ads, and Christmas tree salesmen. At its worst, it might feel like a cynical side of the season. So much of the apparent joy and festivities seem superficial at times. People push and shove in stores to get what they want before somebody else snatches it up. We drive like maniacs, sometimes insisting that we're in a hurry because there's so much to get done before the big day. Attitudes might sour. We may worry that we'll never be able to do it all. And we wonder if doing it all is at all important. How can we find the love, the hope, when they get buried under a checklist? Maybe a slightly cynical slant on the holiday season can serve us well as a wake-up call, as a reality check, bringing into focus the very real fact that although many people celebrate Christmas because it brings them great joy to do so, others celebrate merely because it's what they are expected to do. Still others, we know deep down inside, know that it's Christmas, but they feel they have nothing to celebrate. Of course, there are, all, there are all the people in the world that don't even know that Christmas is coming. They really have no idea what it's all about. The real problem is that this season is not about Christmas. It's about Christ. Today is a good day for us to contemplate this kind of reality check. It's what Advent is all about. Even though we are busy preparing for Christmas during Advent, Advent is not supposed to be a preparation for Christmas. Preparation for Christ, yes, but not for Christmas. In the early churches, there was no Christmas. Celebrating the birth of Jesus did not even begin until the fourth century, and even then it was only common in a few places for a long time. Did you know that Advent used to be just as long as Lent? And it served as a season of fasting and prayer, catechesis and preparation, leading up to baptisms on the Feast of the Epiphany. But today's Gospel reading takes us way before back, uh, back way before that, to a time when there was no Christmas, no Epiphany, no Advent. Sundays were just the first day of everybody's work week. It was a time of political oppression, discouragement, and nasty cold weather. Then this guy named John comes on the scene, J 
Jesus' cousin, who had been a miracle baby for his older parents, Zechariah and Elizabeth. Everybody thought John was a little weird ever since he went off to be a Jewish monk at Qumran, where they baptized themselves and each other several times a day, where the monks went around preaching the end of the world. This John leaves Qumran by the Dead Sea and starts wandering up and down the Jordan River Valley, prophesying and urging people to repent and be baptized into a new, clean life of readiness for the return of God, the kingdom of God. Jesus' followers were quick to recognize John as the voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. Isaiah had foretold such a man. John certainly seemed to fit the bill, even though he looked and smelled a little funny. When John takes his ministry on the road, the people of Israel are on edge already. They needed things to change. There were a lot of political and spiritual movements afoot among the Jews at that time, either to take action to make a difference or to bring people peace of mind in their circumstances, or both. John the Baptizer and his cohort preached this with the strength of the Jewish tradition and the scriptures into this time of uncertainty and expectancy. Today's gospel tells us all this was happening in the 15th year of the reign of the Emperor Tiberius. When Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, Herod was ruler of Galilee, and Herod's brother Philip ruled the regions of Eturia and Trachonitis. A guy named Lysanias ruled over Abilene, and to put an even finer point on things, our reading tells us that John appeared during the high priesthood of Annas and Caiaphas. Do we need to know all that? Well, it seems tedious, and it is. But in the days before our now global economy, it was harder to nail down events and a date in a region that was full of different ethnicities, each with their own calendar. Rome had gobbled up nations and peoples and languages and religions and lots of different calendars around the Mediterranean. So the best way to pinpoint a date in history for centuries was to narrow it down to a time when several different people were in office in different places at the same time. But our point here is the idea of expectancy, of being on edge and looking forward to something. Many of us might be a little on edge today as we get ready for the holidays, as we think about everything that involves. You can bet the people of Israel at the time of Jesus and John were on edge too, expecting something big that felt like it was long overdue. They couldn't take much more. It was time for God to show up and do something. Have you ever felt like that? You maybe feel like that right now? It sure would be nice if God would show up and do something. Advent was custom made for you. Expectancy combined with a healthy dose of ambivalence is how Advent is supposed to feel. We get the word adventure from the word Advent. It just means something is about to happen. We don't know what exactly, just something. We don't know when exactly, just sometime. We're living in the middle of an adventure. We don't know what to expect, we just know to expect, period. Imagine every minute of every day that you're walking through a kind of board game, where your every experience is dictated by a throw of the dice, or maybe that you're walking through a fun house of some kind, where puppets and mannequins dart out in front of you random, randomly and suddenly. The only thing you can predict is that the unpredictable will happen. Well, that's what an adventure is. Going on a vacation without a detailed plan and just seeing what comes up every day. You know that there's going to be road construction, at the very least. <laughs> but beyond that, who knows? Remember the song, Pop Goes the Weasel? Round and round the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. When I was a kid, I had a jack-in-a-box. Probably some of you did, too. When you turned the crank, it would play the song. Round and round the mulberry bush, the monkey chased the weasel. 
You were confident you could give it the first few cranks without any fear. But then I would slow down, anticipating the point when Jack would spring out of the box. It was startling. Even though you knew it was going to happen, it still surprised you every time. Well, during Advent, we are reminded that God is turning the crank. We're reminded that God doesn't stay in the box that we make for him. Today we hear about the beginning of the ministry of John the Baptist. Next week's gospel reading will reveal John the Baptist calling people a brood of vipers, warning them that trees that do not bear fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire, assuming that judgment is upon them and that the all-consuming fire might be just around the corner, people who are listening to John ask, what should we do? What should we do? By contrast, we have our passage from Philippians. Both this week and next week, which gives us Paul's loving and encouraging prayer of empowerment on behalf of his friends in Christ in Philippi. Paul says, For God is my witness, how I long for you with all the compassion of Christ Jesus. He prays those words from his horrendous imprisonment into another stressful setting unfolding around the Philippian churches. A group of committed new Christians beset by persecution from without and all kinds of conflict and leadership from within. Longing is a big part of the anticipation that we feel during Advent. We long for an end. The struggles of the Philippian church are the same that we face in the church every day. We are accosted at every turn. Modern media bombards us with news hour by hour from all over our country and from all over the world. And this news is filtered only by the judgment of the people that it passes through before it is passed on to us, onto our eyes and ears. Raw news is hard to come by, but good news is even harder to come by. Past generations would never have heard about most of the things that we hear about today, and maybe that's the way it should be. We can find so many things to be shocked and grieved about if we want to that it's easy to despair, to just lose perspective. Could we even go to sleep if we thought the world seemed only to be terrible? It's into this very kind of circumstance that John comes ranting and raving and that Paul's words speak hope and direction for us. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Paul does not say to the Philippians, fix your situation and then you can rejoice. He does not say to the Philippians, rise above your circumstances and then you can rejoice. No, he just says, I know you've got all this ugly stuff going on, four chapters worth practically, selfishness, lying, infighting, discrimination by social class, gender, ethnicity, but rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Rejoice right now in the middle of all this bad stuff that's happening. Don't wait for it to go away because it may never go away. Decide to stop obsessing and rejoice. The Lord is near. There's no need to choose denial. God is simply bigger than our negatives. We have the power to decide how we can live in God's goodness, even though we may be surrounded by discouraging circumstances. Maybe this is the kind of repentance that John the Baptist calls us to this morning. We can stop obsessing about how bad everything is, let God change our minds and our hearts, and then turn and go a better direction. That's called repentance. We can decide to be encouraged. Believe me, I'm preaching to myself here too. Our circumstances do not determine how close God is to us. He is right here wanting to break into our lives. And if we pay attention, we just might see and hear him. One of my favorite lines in all of scripture comes from the song of Zechariah, which we read this morning. In the tender compassion of our God, the dawn from on high shall break upon us. 
to shine on those who dwell in darkness and the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. Advent reminds us that the most important unexpected thing in our lives is God. The dawn from on high is set to break upon us, not to crush us or destroy us, not to bring us fear and shame, but to shine in order to dispel the darkness in which we live every day, the darkness that we battle. God is coming. God is here to guide our feet into the way of peace. God is always coming. It is we, God's children, who are now called to be prophets of the Most High. It is we who go before the Lord to prepare his way, to give his people knowledge of salvation and the good news of the forgiveness of their sins. The message Advent should drive home for us is not just that the Lord is coming back soon and that it could happen any moment, which of course it could, but it should remind us that the Lord is near to us right now already. He's sitting next to us with his arm around us. He's facing us in the person that we're talking to. He's sitting on our shoulder, listening to all that we think and say, watching all that we do. He is astonished with us when we are astonished. He grieves with us when we grieve, and he prays with us when we pray. Emmanuel, God with us. God is near. It's just a fact. An incredibly encouraging and perhaps slightly disturbing fact. Our God knows very well that we have plenty of very real things to worry about, but we don't need to worry about those things. The reality of God's presence with us can help us to break our worry habits. Paul knew it is hard to do. Jesus certainly knew it is hard to do. Rejoice in the middle of what is going on. Because God is in the middle of it with us. We have no control over what the world gives us day by day. But we do have control over how we react to it. We can fill our world with our own fretting, or we can let God fill our world with himself. It's Advent. Be ready for God's call to change direction, even if you think you've been going the right direction for quite a while. The point is our readiness, not our certainty. In spite of everything, in spite of discouraging circumstance, in spite of our fears, let us be filled with peace and rejoicing. Christmas is coming, yes. Lots of things are coming. But even more important than that, the Lord is near. He's not just coming someday. He is near. God does not like to stay in his box. No matter what comes, God walks with us. He is near. He is Emmanuel. He breaks through as the dawn from on high. He is here right now. Let us embrace Paul's words to the Philippians. May our love overflow more and more with knowledge and full insight, so that in the day of Christ, today and every day, we may be pure and blameless, producing a harvest of righteousness through Christ Jesus for God's glory in this broken world. Pop goes the weasel. Amen. Please stand as we proclaim our common faith in the words of the Nicene Creed, found on page 326 of the Book of Common Prayer, page 326. 
We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole state of Christ's church and the world. Almighty and ever-living God, who in thy holy word has taught us to make prayers and supplications and to give thanks for all men, receive these our prayers which we offer unto thy divine majesty, beseeching thee to inspire continually the universal church with the spirit of truth, unity, and concord, and grant that all those who do confess thy holy name may agree in the truth of thy holy word and live in unity and godly love. Lord, in thy mercy. Give grace, O Heavenly Father, to all bishops and other ministers, that they may both by their life and doctrine set forth thy true and lively word and rightly and duly administer thy holy sacraments. Lord, in thy mercy. And to all thy people give thy heavenly grace, and especially to this congregation here present that with meek heart and due reverence they may hear and receive thy holy word, truly serving thee in holiness and righteousness all the days of their life. Lord, in thy mercy, hear our prayer. We beseech thee also so to rule the hearts of those who bear the authority of government in this and every land, that they may be led to wise decisions and right actions for the welfare and peace of the world. Lord, in thy mercy. Amen. Open, O Lord, the eyes of all people to behold thy gracious hand in all thy works, that rejoicing in thy whole creation, they may honor thee with their substance and be faithful stewards of thy bounty. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. And we most humbly beseech thee of thy goodness, O Lord, to comfort and succor Alex, Robert, Grant, Anna Claire, Adam, Mike, Ellen, Andrea, Barbara, Jarrett, Joe, Amber, Selena, Narni, Sean, Rosina, Betty, Bobby, Betsy, Carrie, Jennifer, Lori, Elaine, Cervella, Jesse, Lynn, Susan, and Diana. Are there others? And all those who in this transitory life are in trouble, sorrow, need, sickness, or any other adversity. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. We pray thy blessing on Lord, O Lord, on all those whose birthdays we celebrate this week, especially Lucas. Beseeching thee to fill them with thy grace and heavenly benediction. Lord, in thy mercy. Hear our prayer. And we also bless thy holy name for all thy servants departed this life in thy faith and fear, 
beseeching thee to grant them continual growth in thy love and service, and to grant us grace so to follow the good examples of the ever-blessed Virgin Mary, blessed Michael, and of all thy saints, that with them we may be partakers of thy heavenly kingdom. Lord, in thy mercy. Ye who do truly and earnestly repent you of your sins, and are in love and charity with your neighbors, and intend to lead a new life, following the commandments of God, and walking from henceforth in his holy ways, draw near with faith, and make your humble confession to Almighty God, devoutly kneeling. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against thee in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved thee with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of thy Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in thy will and walk in thy ways to the glory of thy name. Amen. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, who of his great mercy hath promised forgiveness of sins to all those who with hearty repentance and true faith turn unto him, have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and bring you to everlasting life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Hear the word of God to all who truly turn to him. Come unto me, all ye that travail and are heavy laden, and I will refresh you. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, to the end that all that believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Ascribe unto the Lord the honor to his name, bring offerings, and come into his courts.
Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is very meet, right, in our bounden duty that we should at all